All right, the Zoom room is starting to fill up. I want to welcome everybody in. Go ahead and use the chat feature at the bottom of your video screen to let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. We are just a minute or two behind, uh, but we will catch right back up and get right on schedule here in just a minute. We have a great virtual speaker series program lined up for you today. We're looking to forward to talking with Todd Lajeunesse. He's going to talk all about coral reefs and the work that he's doing on protecting them. We will get started in just one minute. Thanks for joining us. Like I said, use the chat feature to let us know who you are and where you're zooming in from today. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Oh, thanks, Christine. The host has disabled chat. So I'm asking people to use something that they're not able to use. All right. Good afternoon, Penn Staters, and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream to text link in the chat. Today's virtual speaker session is made possible through the generosity of Matthew and Karen Keller, both 2000 grads of the Everly College of Science and loyal supporters of the Penn State Alumni Association. The Kellers created a program endowment at the Alumni Association and are sponsoring an annual event that features the Everly College of Science and its professors and students. Today, we welcome Dr. Todd Lajeunesse, a tenured professor in the Department of Biology here at Penn State. He'll be presenting on coral reefs, which are globally widespread and have enormous economic and ecological value. These biologically diverse and highly productive habitats are extraordinary because, of, because animals, um, not plants, form foundations of ecosystems. However, the simple coral animal is only able to do this with the help of single-celled algae thriving in their tissues. This discussion will highlight Penn State's scientific contributions toward understanding the basic biology of, the, of, these, criti of these critical multi uh, mutualisms and knowledge is gained by doing field research around the world and carrying out genetic analysis by Dr. Todd Lajeunesse in his laboratory here at Penn State. Todd's a leading scholar on ecology and evolution and mutualistic relationships, notably reef building, reef building corals and photosynthesis uh, microalgae. His, bio, his laboratory conducts field and laboratory experiments on the diversity, ecology, and evolution of coral symbiosis all over the world to understand how climate change affects corals and to discover how they respond to rapid environmental change. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Todd Lajeunesse to today's virtual speaker series. Todd, we'll turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Paul, for that uh, nice introduction and Carrie for and also inviting me for today. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, it's been a long semester, we're almost done, but um, I'm happy to be here. It's been a, actually a, a great morning. I, I received a, a gift, a delivery by my colleagues from Ohio State. I haven't read the card yet, but I'm sure it says nice things about, about, about me. I, they must have known that I was giving a talk today. So anyway, um, so what do I do and what's, what, what am I, uh, what's my research focus? So I'm going to share my screen and see if we can do this okay. All right, uh, so I wanna to talk to you today about a, an incredibly important ecosystem on our planet. Those are, those are coral reef ecosystems and the importance of microbes to these ecosystems. 
but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been at Penn State for about 15 years now. You can see that I've embraced the central Pennsylvania culture, um, but I, am a, I uh, began as a marine biologist at a very, very young age. My parents were a little worried, but uh, they think they're happy now. Things worked out, but I was a peculiar kid. I grew up in Maine and developed my love for the ocean while working for the town of Brunswick doing resource conservation, mostly on our clam flats and other areas where uh, marine life is really important for economies. And uh, to this day, uh, a number of degrees later and, and many years later, I am still working in marine systems, studying the biology of corals. Uh, but I also want to mention that I do teach quite a bit at Penn State. One of my beloved courses is invertebrate zoology. This is our recent field trips. So these are future alumni, um, and it's a, it's a lecture and laboratory upper division course. So you're seeing juniors and seniors. But recently, I had an opportunity to be a faculty host on one of the alumni trips. And this is a shameless plug for uh, those of you looking for adventure and travel. I would recommend the Tahiti trip. It is by far um, one of the better experiences I've had on core reef ecosystems. And trust me, I've traveled all over the world. Um, I usually don't travel in that kind of style, but I got used to it quickly. Um, but it was a, a lot of fun. And I, while there, I wanted to make sure that uh, the, the participants understood and, and appreciated the ecosystem that they were seeing. Uh, I guess most people don't realize that um, there's a lot that goes into these reef ecosystems. So this is Bora Bora, one of the islands we uh, adventured to and, 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 and visited. Uh, and what is important to realize is that it is a combination of two geological features. One is the center part. It's a volcanic island, uh, an old a dormant volcano, a dead volcano. And then all around it is actually a carbonate, calcium carbonate reef structure. And so if you, this is Bora Bora again, and what I'm highlighting here is the, the dark gray, black is the volcanic landmass, and all of the white around it is the calcium carbonate. So if we were to take a cross section through Bora Bora and all the islands in the Pacific, what you have there is a, a very large underwater volcano, and then a, a massive skirt of calcium carbonate rock that wraps around it. And well, how did that what is that material? Where did that come from? Well, uh, to give you an uh, example of how thick these, these calcium carbonate skirts are, how massive they are, I, um, this is a, a cross section here showing you the little island at the top, but then under, underwater, what you don't see is all that ca white calcium carbonate. And uh, some of these uh, get incredibly thick, 2,000 meters or so in thickness. And to show you an, a, how that was, would relate to, say, man-made structures, these are the world's tallest buildings. And you can see that the structure is way larger than that. Well, where did that material come from? What produced that material? And what's, what's, uh, what, what, what drives its, its ecology and evolution? Enter the coral. These are animals. They are clonal animals. They um, have a special ability. And that is they utilize sunlight to grow. Well, how are they able to do that? So I'm going to talk to, walk you through a little bit about coral biology. So hang in there. So this is a close-up of a branching colony. And you can see those little clusters on there. And those are actually little polyps. Uh, think about their little sea anemones. Um, and they secrete calcium carbonate. But it, what they have is important. So let's focus in on one of the polyps, one of the anemones. Zoom in, and here is a, a fancy uh, confocal microscopy image of that polyp. You can see the blue tentacles in a circle with the mouth in the center. But what the lower portion here you see is a cross section, and those little pink dots are the microalgae that Paul was telling you about. Um, it represents a large bit of biomass of these animals, and these are critical for the coral's health. Without the presence of these little pink brown balls, uh, the animal does not live, cannot live. And so what, let's focus in a little bit further. Uh, this is a SEM cross-section, and once again, these little uh, balls here are the uh, endosymbiotic uh, algae. 
They live in the cells of the animal. So it's a highly intimate relationship, very, very unusual. And it's a mutualism. And the both partners, both the alga, the single cell alga, and the animal uh, achieve a lot of nutrient exchange. And this is why you have a highly productive ecosystem in ocean waters that tend to be very, very nutrient poor. It's the, the basis of, the, of these ecosystems is this very simple mutualism between an animal and a microalga, a, a, a microbe. So that's again highlights the importance. So uh, very much like the forests ecosystems around the planet, coral reefs are, are uh, um, important and, and, and widespread. But instead of the, uh, the basis of the ecosystem being a plant, the basis of these ecosystems is an animal, an animal that's mutualistic with, with algae. And of course, these ecosystems depend on the photons that come from our sun. That's obviously critical. And to compare corals with plants, uh, and there's a lot of comparisons that can be made. You can think of a polyp as a leaf, if you will, in, in the coral colony. What's really an interesting is that given the amount of light absorbed and the amount of chlorophyll used, you could argue that corals are actually much more efficient at absorbing a lot more photons and therefore energy than, than plants are. So li literally, corals are animals that photosynthesize. They're plant-like. And again, that's why they are the basis of these ecosystems worldwide. What's really unique and why they're able to capture so much light, so many photons, is this is a cross-section through the tissues of a coral. And these brown balls here are examples of, of endosymbionts. And the yellow arrows here are, is, is the light pe penetrating through the tissue. But it hits the skeleton underneath and then backscatters up. And so any photons that miss the alga passing through the tissue get backscattered against the, the uh, uh, going the other direction. And it's likely that at some point, uh, photons are going to be captured again by, by the, the symbiont, the resident symbiont. So there's a, a close intimate relationship, not only between the cells of the animal and the symbiont, but the importance of the skeleton in capturing light. And so you can sort of see that here, this, these are just naked skeletons. And what we've done is we've shown a laser beam on them and you can see how much light gets scattered. So these are adaptations in these animals, in these colonies for capturing light. So we can say that ultimately coral ecosystems is highly dependent and is arguably an emergent pro property of this mutualism. So that's a big deal. And again, this is, is global. And of course, I, I, I will, um, I, it's hard to emphasize the importance of this ecosystem to our planet and to, to humans. They're, they're, they have an important ecological value including uh, fisheries um, here. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. Um, uh, coastal protection and biodiversity. And biodiversity plays a lot of role, including the uh, discovery of new drugs, uh, anti-cancer agents, and a variety of other kinds of drugs that are discovered from animals that live on coral ecosystems. So that is um, very, very important. Um, but these ecosystems, like many on the planet, are under threat. And so things like uh, emissions, uh, point source pollution runoff from, from uh, agriculture and from rivers, overfishing, again, ocean acidification, disease, and much on a much larger scope, the increased warming of our oceans and the degradation of the mutualism which I'll talk to you in a little bit. Um, it turns out that the greatest strength of these mutualisms is its greatest weakness. When exposed to unusually high temperatures, the symbiosis disassociates and the, um, the algae begin getting cast away and, and are lost from the animal. And what you see on the right side here is the a uh, colony that is now uh, lost a lot of its dinoflag, it's, it's microalgae, it's, it's symbionts, and it's look, looking bone white. Now that animal may recover its algae if, if it's not too severe. If it doesn't do that in enough time, it will basically starve and, and die. And that, that's uh, the negative impact of, of climate change. And so here's an a, a example of a, a chlor chloral bleaching event. And these can be 
uh, widespread over many thousands of kilometers and have a, a, a negative, massive negative impact on, on a system. So here's a, here's a, a nice caricature of, the, of a coral reef and it bleaches and things do survive, but not everything survives. And so you get a, a loss of uh, coral cover, coral diversity, and over time, this can have a, a major impact on the functioning of the ecosystem. And as you get, you go from a healthy ecosystem here to one that bleaches to one, one that is dead. But fear not, uh, these ecosystems are incredibly uh, resilient. They've been around for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. And they have dealt with severe climate change in the past. Uh, to that end, my research is focused uh, primarily on whether there are, are a lot of microbes in all kinds of ecosystems, especially coral reef ecosystems. Mine has been the focus of the relationship between corals and these, and these microalgae. Uh, for that, I have had the privilege over my years of, of research to investigate many areas around the planet. This is a uh, illustration of, of the distribution of coral reefs worldwide. You can see that there's some color coordination with the different regions. These are different biogeographic provinces. So there are different kinds of fish, different kinds of corals, and there are different kinds of environments as well. Some are cold water reefs, some are warmer water reefs. Um, but it, again, this gives you a good impression of how widespread these systems are. And these are the locations where I a, have either been to and, and worked in, or I've received samples from colleagues from around the world uh, to do my analyses. So from this perspective, I've learned a, quite a bit about the ecology and evolution of this mutualism, uh, patterns of biogeography, patterns of host symbiont specificity. And that's allowed me to ask really uh, more, more precise questions and to do experiments. So currently, um, I am not kidding you, this is one of my reef sites. We do, we've been doing a lot of work in Palau to get at questions of, of corals and their response to climate change. This represents uh, an, my, our offshore site location. Palau is of particular interest because it's got these really pristine offshore uh, barrier reefs, uh, but it also has these inshore sites that are uh, quite a bit different. So here's, here's a, an out, outer reef. Again, the water quality is really clear. The temperatures are mild. The, the acidity is, is normal. Um, it's, it's basic. But contrast that with the nearshore reefs of Palau, uh, it's extremely different. The waters here are a lot warmer. They are a lot more turbid. It's more acidic. And yet in the nearshore reefs of Palau, the coral growth is fantastic. Um, a lot of diversity and very healthy animals. So this is a natural experiment where we can learn about comparing and contrasting inshore and offshore reefs and see how are they able to do this? What's, what's, what's the secret behind their biology? And this might give us some insight into how these systems have responded to climate change in the past and will respond to climate change in the future, which is happening. Um, one of the big questions that, that it's in the field right now is that, well, you might have in one case, a, a colony that contains a sensitive symbiont uh, versus a colony that contains a, a thermally tolerant symbiont. Obviously, the, the colony with a thermally tolerant symbiont is going to do pretty well during one of these high high heat events. Uh, but there might be a drawback, and, and there's a lot in the literature that, well, um, animals or colonies with a sensitive symbiont actually re receive more nutrients, translocated nutrients, than animals or colonies that have a thermally tolerant symbiont. So this is analogous to, well, if you have a, a thermally sensitive yet high functioning symbiont, it's like eating a filet mignon, if you would, pardon me, if you want, want to do the comparison versus that of maybe a, a crappy cheeseburger. Uh, the trade-off would be, well, you might be thermally tolerant, but you're not growing very well. You're not reproducing enough gametes for, for future generations. Uh, but I question that dogma because a lot of the work up until recently has been focused on uh, kind of unusual combinations. And so I wanted to go to a place like Palau where I know that the, the, the corals are co-evolved with sensitive symbionts, but they're also co-evolved with thermally tolerant symbionts. So all those animals that are in the inshore have an unusual symbiont that lives with them that is highly thermally tolerant. So our questions going to plow is to investigate a little bit further about, well, how do these animals function if we were to say to bring them from the inshore environment to the offshore environment? 
So I've got a, a couple of pretty videos to show you guys. I'm not going to go too, too into depth about the actual details of the research, but videos can tell a lot. So these are uh, my colleague from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and my graduate student from Penn State, and they're going for a swim. Oops, let me see if I can get this. To... I'll try to narrate as we go. So, so here, there we're, we're uh, again a, a valuable tool kit in our in our research is hammer and chisel. I know that some of you might be horrified by that, but it turns out that um, um, the animals there um, rebound quickly. They're constantly growing, and a few weeks later, you you don't know that we've been there to take samples. And there they are. We're, we're preserving some samples for DNA analysis. You can see that we um, we uh, use plastic Ziploc bags. They are an essential toolkit in, in our research that in zip ties. Um, we collect a lot of specimens. We, we, we take samples, uh, but we also do other things with them. And this is, I just want to show you, that was uh, images from the offshore. This shows you some images of the nearshore environment. Again, look at that beautiful coral cover. Very healthy animals living here. There I am going overboard. I do scuba dive from time to time. Although every week or so I spend in the field, it's months and years in the laboratory here in Happy Valley. So, um, I, so our, my time in the field is precious and, and very brief. Um, uh, we have a lot of uh, ongoing projects. I'll get to some of them. One of them, though, it has to do with maintaining these long-term transects, where every six months we go out to uh, offshore and inshore reefs. We have colonies that we've tagged there, and we sample them because we want to see what the symbiont is and, and whether or not that symbiont has changed, how st stable the mutualism is, among other things. And this is just another video here showing you that when we do get the samples back, this is what we do with them. So this is this is this is really important for our experimentation. So we've got a bunch of colony fragments, which we've chipped off uh, from colonies we've been working with for years. We bring them to our seawater tanks at Pickrick, which is a, a, a research station in Palau. We pull out the, the fragments, making sure that we keep them all in order. We then uh, might make small fragments of them. Again, these are modular animals. We can cut them up like, like basically getting cuttings from a plant, and we can make little colonies. And so we're using a marine Z-spar there, and we've got the... Uh, colonies all uh, settled. And so these are little experimental samples here where we will do research uh, in, the, in the laboratory here at the station. And then some of them will actually be transplanted back offshore or inshore to see how they do in nature. So again, that, that's quite an involved process. Um, this is us. This is the we're obviously you can tell we're at the inshore environment. We've got these small colonies. They've all been attached to this mesh, and we are about to go in the water and attach them to a platform, and then hope for the best. Come back in six months or a year and 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 and, and retrieve them. This is this is our offshore grow out site, and I'll show you an example. So we we um, we place these. Obviously, they have a nice cage over them because. Turns out that fish like to eat corals, and if you put a small little coral colony, uh, fish will come along and, and chew those corals up. So we have a little protection here. So let's see. There. So this is just when we've pl first placed them down, and then this is six months later when we're coming back. We have to remove the cage. You can see all of the stuff that's growing on the cage. Taking those little platforms back, we, we clean them up, and then we can begin doing our experiments. This is where we torture the corals. Uh, we have a lot of replicates. We have a lot of things we do. We, we're looking at calcification rates. We're looking at translocation rates. We're looking at uh, respiration rates, photosynthetic rates, a lot of different metrics to evaluate the functioning of the coral. And of course, we're using a lot of different species of coral, and we're using corals with different symbiont species that they're associated with. This is, ends with a nice view of the um, site in Palau, our, our um, onshore research site. But the take home on, on all of this, I won't get into too many of the uh, scientific details, is that there's a, a, a variety of ways which, which these animals are going to respond to change, climate change. Um, there's the really straightforward that most animals do. Like when it gets colder in the winter, we get used to the cold. When it gets warmer in the summer, we get used to the hot. 
very the same way with, with corals. They can acc acclimatize or acclimate depending on um, the species, and that can take hours to months. Uh, contrast that with having a different symbiont present. That can actually only take months to years and can radically change the physiology of the animal. So this represents something that potentially is important. Con and, and one final uh, note is that Adaptation can occur, so natural selection, evolutionary processes, but that is a very, very slow process. So when we think about in the near term and with the remaining part of the century, it's going to be the role of the symbiont and its physiology and its ability to associate with these animals that's probably going to be the most important aspect of whether or not these animals can survive uh, going into the future. Um, so again, highlighting that animals, these uh, corals are animals, they're simple uh, pol polyp based animals that divide and create these massive colonies, uh, and uh, all is driven by the presence of these um, very tiny mi microscopic algae that live in huge abundances in their tissues, and the species of that symbiont can really determine the well-being of that animal now and going into the future. So with that, um, the images that you saw, the, the videos that I showed, comes from Palau Glimmer of Hope by Galen Rosenwax. So if you want to know more and learn more about our research in Palau, I would um, point you to the YouTube. It's only about an eight-minute video. It's really pretty, pretty good. Um, there's a pl plenty of, of investigators, colleagues from other universities, students that have contributed to a lot of this work ongoing. Of course, the National Science Foundation is a big funder of this work. And with that, I will take any questions and share my screen. All right, Todd, thank you so much for walking us through that presentation. We do have a number of questions that have come in earlier. We encourage people to use the Q&A tab on the bottom if you have any more questions that you would, that you would like to ask. Um, the first comes from Carol. Carol asks, um, snorkeling in the Caribbean and seeing a lot of degradation. Yes. One location that seems to thrive is a long dock, very few, very few cruise ships, and lots of concrete that coral is, are attached to. Can you discuss what attempts at encouraging growth of coral have been successful? Yeah, uh, so uh, coral farming and uh, reef reclamation is, is a big deal right now. There's a lot of money that's in, in that. Um, including involving uh, setting up artificial reefs with concrete and then gluing colonies. Again, you saw in my videos, you, we can fragment colonies and then place glue them in place and then they will begin growing. And so there's a lot of that work going on, especially around Miami. Um, uh, again, a lot of focus is on, on animal husbandry, how to best grow these animals growing animals that are that innately have, have the right genotype that are thermally tolerant and perhaps with the right kind of symbiont is really a, a big thing. Uh, the Caribbean certainly of, of all the places in the world is an area that is, has seen the, the most degradation by far. Um, again, where I work in Palau, it's, it's a, still a very, very pristine ecosystem. Uh, it, it hasn't really been hit by severe coral bleaching and mortality. It's for us, for working on a, a baseline reef, it's it's perfect. Uh, it, it is like going back in time, um, but there are still a lot of places around the world where, where corals are still thriving. With that said, there are places like the Caribbean where things are in rough shape. And that again has to do with a, a lot of factors. It's not just one, but a lot of factors. So, so, so yeah, you, look, you'll get, you get those places where there'll be pockets of, of healthy corals. And there's a lot of reasons why that may, they might be the genotype of those corals, the genetic composition of those corals, and it might be the symbionts that they have as well. So Jay has a question. Um, he's requesting feedback on the lobster ban and its effect on ecosystems and economy of the New England region. Yeah. I don't know how much that's related to the work that no, you're it's, doing. No, it's fine because I, 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 you know, I teach invertebrate zoology and we, we talk about um, uh, Maine a lot, obviously. I am biased, but, but it's an important example of climate change and how that's influencing marine resources. Of course, Maine is one of the states that is heavily dependent on the ocean for, for its economy. And I, I'm aware, I'm, par, I'm marginally aware of one, I think it was Whole Foods wanted to ban Maine lobster because 
they were um, assuming that the uh, buoy lines that, that attached the, the, the traps to, to the buoys at the top of the surface were getting, the, the, the right whales were getting caught up in them. I, I don't know if that's, if that's a thing. Uh, again, it's, I, I think it's, it's unusual that this is now a thing because for decades, there's, I mean, there's been no harvesting of right whales and there's been no issue. So I'm, I'm not sure what brought that to uh, Whole Foods' attention. But um, yeah, certainly um, ropes do get entwined and we, we do know about that. But I'm not sure that that's as significant as maybe it's being, uh, we're being led to believe, but we'll see. So uh, uh, Donald Leak uh, just wants to say hi. Um, and he was with uh, you on a Tahiti oh, yeah. trip and agrees with you um, that it was a great trip. Uh, let's see, some other comments and questions coming in. How does sea level rise affect coral? Yeah, another good question. Uh, because uh, if it's too fast, you're going to get, you have a situation where as the water gets too deep, there's a situation called light attenuation. And so um, animals that if reef isn't being able to keep pace with the rising sea level, they're going to get deeper and deeper and it's going to get darker and darker for those animals. And so they're not going to be able to photosynthesize as much and they won't be able to grow as fast. So that's going to be an issue. But at the same time, it will make new substrate uh, other places where corals can settle and grow in more shallower environments as those get inundated with the ocean. So uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to say that corals, even though many consider them to be sacred cows, they're really weeds. They'll grow everywhere if given a chance, and and, and they're very tenacious. And so, um, so I, I think again, the, the rising sea level is is uh, is they, they, I mean, they, they will find a way to, to persist and and, and and proliferate. So um, yeah. So Jan Jan is a scuba diver. She wants to know what are the best practices of those of us who are scuba divers that we can adopt that we can adopt beyond good buoyancy control and not touching the reef. I think I think if she said it, good buoyancy control is the key. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that that is really. I think I see a lot of uh, amateur scuba divers, and it's normal um, where you don't really have good control, and that that's one thing you, you need to work on. Yeah, uh, touching the coral. Sure, there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to touch the coral. It necessarily it won't necessarily hurt them if you just touch them once or twice. Um, but if you have an area where there's a lot of scuba divers, a lot of visitors constantly touching the same colonies, that's bad. Um, there are things in the ocean that you don't want to touch because they'll sting you and right. they, they can lead to severe welts and, and, and painful uh, abrasions and, 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 and toxins. Um, but uh, you know, again, there's a lot of talk about sunscreens, which uh, in reading those papers, they're, a little, they're really questionable, actually. Um, um, I think that the, the, there's really one paper that, that focuses on that, that I think that they just use a, a tremendous amount of the one uh, compound that's in the sunscreen. It's really unrealistic. But uh, again, I think, again, not kicking over the corals and staying a healthy distance from from the reef is, is fine, but that that would be my. I think that she was she's right. Buoyancy controls everything. So Robin wants to know how many research facilities of yours have been decimated by storms, and also what are the impact of storms on the reefs themselves? Um, storms. I mean, again, these are ecosystems that have evolved with storms, and storms play an important role in and maintaining diversity it's again these these intermediate disturbances and again let's face it a storm is not it's, it's somewhat localized and so um there have been a number of, of typhoons that have hit palau while we were working there not while we were there but but during the years of our work and a couple of them have destroyed some of our grow out sites and that's the the challenge of working in in the field you you have to uh, hope for the best and this, things are out of your control sometimes. Um, but what I've seen from severe areas that, that the, uh, the reefs, yeah, the really shallow parts get scoured by, by the wave storm, the wave energy, but they do re respond and rebound quite quickly. Um, 
even in our long-term site, we've been working there for nine years, the offshore site, uh, it went through a period where, geez, the corals don't look very healthy. They just, and I think that had been hit by a couple of storms, but I was just there in June and it's fantastic. It's, it's incredibly resilient. Uh, again, given enough other colonies, they, they reproduce and the propagules settle and they start growing very quickly. And some of these corals can grow six, seven inches or 10 inches a, a year, depending on the species. And so they, they are highly, highly resilient if they have source populations to contribute to, to new settled larvae. Um, so, so yeah, but, but storms are an issue. I, I think that that's, you know, and obviously the argument, well, our, our, stor our storm intensity is increasing. That That's, a, yeah, possibly a thing, but again, these animals are, are adapted for that. So that's not as big of a deal as large scale ocean warming. So Peter, uh, points out that carbon dioxide is important is important for photosynthesis. How much dissolved CO2 is in water? And how do you determine sources of alternative carbon for photosynthesis? Well, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, a loaded question. Um, so yeah, obviously <laughs> CO2 in any photosynthetic organism, CO2 is kind of critical. You, you need access to that. Um, uh, the oceans, of course, are naturally buffered. They have a lot of uh, ions in there. So uh, so uh, there are different parts of the oceans that are undergoing acidification more than others. Um, again, coral reef ecosystems tend to be a little bit more buffered. Uh, the corals themselves, when they're alive, because they're coated with a layer of tissue, the, the skeleton underneath is actually protected from any slightly acidic. So again, the, the uh, inshore animals in Palau, for example, the, the, the waters there are relatively acidic relative to the offshore environments, um, but they don't necessarily suffer the, the acidification. It's the actual reef structure, the calcium carbonate that gets left behind when the colonies die. Those begin to deteriorate a lot faster. So, so ocean acidification won't necessarily affect too much live animals. Um, although there's still a lot of research going on with that, um, they tend to actually eat away a little bit more fast the actual reef structure, the carbonate reef structure. So um, Greg wants to know if there are any volunteer opportunities in the Bahamas similar to the ones you mentioned in Palau. There, there is a, a Lee Stocking Island has a marine station there, um, a long history of, of, of really exceptional research. The Bahamas is going through a period right now. I've, I've got other colleagues that have a, a project out there, but the country is evaluating who can do research there. And they put a moratorium currently on, on basic research on Bahamian corals. So I'm not sure what the future of the Bahamas holds with regard to, to basic research. Um, and I'm not necessarily the person to talk to about that, but, sure. but I can certainly provide contacts if you, if you want to know more. Um, what are your opinions on MSC Cruise Line who are working to restore Ocean K Marine and Reserve in the Caribbean and also involved in coral reef research? Do you partner with them? I, I, I do not. Um, I am aware that obviously companies are that, that rely on these ecosystems for their well-being. Um, are of interest to, to not only to help, but probably to look good uh, for the public. I really can't comment on that. I, I don't know very much about what's going right. on. I think that they're probably contributing to efforts to rehabilitate, to uh, to regrow corals and the reefs. Um, but that's as much as I know. Um, but, but, but again. You, you touched on point source uh, pollution. Um, I know that there are a number of commercial, a number of companies that are involved in um, cleaning up coral reefs. Uh, yeah. You know, countries will will hire them to come in to clean the reefs. Uh, is that is that effort worthwhile? Will will coral regenerate? Um, what's the benefit of of cleaning a reef as opposed to reintroducing new coral? Well, I think that that's essential, especially for um, reefs that are near human development. Having a good wastewater treatment plant system, uh, even even in Palau, when, while we were there, they were digging up the roads and putting new pipes in, and uh, and, and and 
kind trying more to control their 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 pollution their sewage that's really really valuable i i know that many years ago the florida keys uh invested heavily uh in in converting a lot of their um their their septic systems to, to sewage their, their uh, leach fields to sewage so that all that can be contained brought to a sewage, sewage treatment plant and then processed um, and denitrified there because uh, again, a lot of these environments, even the land, like I said, with Borbora, it's porous, it's got calcium carbonate, so any kind of water will filter through and then eventually show up on the reef, carrying with it its nutrients. So any way to contain that is, is a good thing. Um, what, what is the trickle-down effect to, to reefs dying? Um, how does that affect kind of the, the, the yeah. ecosystems and, and kind of the, what, what's, what's the big picture effect? Right, so you, you can go down the list. So um, as the reef begins to, well, first of all, if the corals are not there or there's not enough of them, the reef stops growing. Um, so, and then it also begins to diminish. So it begins to shrink, which means that um, storms that would, you know, would, would use all of their energy on the reef would then, then roll over that reef and then use all of their energy on, on the land and, and human dwellings. Um, Corals provide a tremendous amount of habitat, that three-dimensionality of, of, of the ecosystems created by the coral. So that much more habitat. The corals themselves are food for lots of things, whether things are eating the actual coral or the mucus coming off the coral, it's places to hide and live. So there's millions of species of invertebrates that live on coral ecosystems. And 25% of all fish on the planet are associated with uh, coral ecosystems. So a tremendous amount of fish diversity is dependent on them for, for their well-being, their persistence. Um, so, uh, and again, fish are obviously economically quite quite valuable um, for for um, not only for, for for eating them, but people like to go scuba diving and look at them. One of the things that Palau has going for it is that it was the first nation on the planet to actually ban sharking. And they realized that a live shark is much more valuable than a dead shark because people want to go to ecosystems, these ecosystems, and see big things. Yeah, the, the corals aside, which I, I don't take offense to, but they want to see big fish, big sharks, manta rays, all, all kinds of other rays. And, and that's one of those countries that realizes that the live animals are the resource. That brings the tourists. They want to see that because there's a lot of places where you can't see that anymore. And by right. the way, sea turtles as well. Um, and so that that's really important. And I think that other countries are, are trying to use Palau as a model. Like, look, yeah, that's, you know, once it, once our ecosystem goes, what have we got in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Not much. So, yeah. so it's, it's important to keep that a, a high, healthy, vital, uh, complete resource ecosystem functioning. Todd, if people are interested in learning more about your work, when, where can they go to find more information? I, I do have a website, but uh, we, you know, I, I'm happy to. I, actually, I, I wrote a, I wrote a recent article, in Coral Magazine, and this is a magazine that goes to people who who are in the aquarium trade. Uh, again, that's a, a whole uh, other uh, group of people that I work with and talk to, and it's a really nice article. We can make it available as a PDF on the website here, along with a link to the, this talk if you want to. Um, you can always email me. Um, you can provide that information. And, Excellent. Uh, oh, yeah, there's plenty of ways to find me. Excellent. We will provide that contact information. Uh, in the follow-up email that we send to all of the participants. Todd, we want to thank you for joining us on the virtual speaker series and for sharing the great work that you're doing. For those of you who are tuned in, go to our website to find more events like this, more virtual events, more in-person events at alumni.psu.edu. Todd, I see the roses behind you and that you are excited about the Rose Bowl. We are, we are as well. And we encourage everybody to go back out to uh, alumni.psu.edu to find out all the information about travel to the upcoming Rose Bowl trip. Thanks for joining us, Todd. We are Penn State.